Welcome to the Morinoco, the podcast bringing you interesting and awesome conversations with people around northern Colorado. I am your host, Ivan Wayne. Hit it. Everyone. Believe me when I say that I learned a lot during this episode. Our guests dropped some serious knowledge about our local environment and the health of our water ecosystem. Her name is Jen, and she has an awesome role of bringing people together to take care of our home here in northern Colorado. So without further ado, let's hear what she has to say. I sit here in the Innosphere, am I correct? Yes. With Jennifer, and uh, we got a nice little view today. It's a little cloudy in Fort Collins, but here we sit. What is the <coughs> Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed? The Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed, or CPRW, is a coalition of partners and uh, agencies that work together to plan, prioritize, and implement high-priority restoration activities throughout the Cache La Poudre watershed. So that's all parts of the river and the watershed from the headwaters all the way to the confluence with the South Platte River. Okay, yeah. So where's the start? Does it start like way up in the Rockies somewhere and ends yeah. out past Greeley? Am I mistaken? No, that's correct. Okay. Uh, it's the, the headwaters or the very tippy top of the river and the watershed start up um, in Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, in addition, on the North Fork of the Poudre River, um, it goes up close to the Wyoming border. Those flow all the way to um, the South Platte River. So just past uh, or just east of Greeley, that forms the whole watershed of the Cashflow Poudre. Yeah, and we record here in the middle of April. So the snow melt is about to begin, right? Or Well, the peak of snow melt as measured in town is usually in the first week or two of June. Okay. So we have a we have a little bit of time until the peak of runoff that we'll see here in the flat parts of the river. Out of my own curiosity, if a water droplet or a body of water were to start up at the top where you mentioned in Rocky Mountain mm -hmm. National, how long would it take to get through the whole chamber through the Poudre River out here? Well, that depends on how you uh -oh. look at it. And I don't really know the answer to that question. Right. <laughs> That's a longer question for me to answer. Just based on like where it splits off, what happens, um, the and way it gets stored. and The water doesn't move uh, without barriers mm -hmm. in the in the system so in addition to you know natural processes that where it sinks into the the ground or it gets evapotranspired or pulled out of the ground by trees and back into the atmosphere the parts that move through the river some of that is captured for storage sometimes some of that water is stored for more than a specified for a longer period of time sometimes it's released at the end of every year uh, then it's also we use water for irrigation purposes, so water is also pulled off the river and then put back onto the land, and then it comes back to the river. Mm -hmm. So it's not that easy, that straightforward, <laughs> right. a question to answer. Well, that's it's, good. it's not a like it takes ten days. Yeah, um, but there are you can measure how. Uh, the river rises once melt, snow melt happens, starts happening, and you can measure those changes in the main stem and see how water levels get higher over time mm. um, from runoff through peak runoff and then over time in the year. And so you can go online and look at river gauge data and see those changes over time. But that's the total bulk of water that's in mostly in the main stem. That's a different question from a specific drop of water. How right. long does it take once it falls on the land to get to Greeley? And uh, these human-made interventions to collect water, store for a certain period mm -hmm. of time. You mentioned irrigation. Are there other things going on like sampling or, you know, like what other specifications or what could we be after for storing water? 
if you're asking why, like, what do we use the water for when sure. we store it? Yeah. Uh, so storage is used, water that is stored is used either for municipal uses, so drinking water, mm. uh, the beer at all of the breweries throughout the front hey, range. what's up? <laughs> Rely a lot heavily on water from the Poudre River to make the high quality beers that we have. That's the high quality water that we have is why we one of the many reasons why we have so many craft breweries um, in this area the other uses beyond drinking water other industrial uses so we do have um, a large suite of different industries that are high water users for different industrial purposes and then agriculture agriculture is a huge part of northern colorado's economy and Obviously, it relies heavily on the use of water to irrigate mm -hmm. crops or to provide water for animals as well. You mentioned the coalitions. One of your main responsibilities and charges is restoration. And for me, I immediately think erosion, but I feel like that may be a tiny chapter in the story of what you all are up to. Actually, erosion is one of the main reasons why we got started in the first place. So the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed started off as an informal collaborative after the High Park Fire and the Hewlett Gulch Fire in the summer of 2012. Mm -hmm. When those two events happened back to back, there was a lot of concern about how wildfires of that size and intensity would negatively affect the watershed. Most people, when they think of wildfires, they think of all the, the drama and the, uh, the pain and the suffering of when the event is happening. So when the flames are going, that is really what captures people's attention and the public's attention. But from the perspective of a forest and a river and our need to maintain drinking water supplies, it's the after effects of those types of wildfires that really have a long lasting uh, fingerprint on the watershed and the communities that depend on the water that comes from the watershed. So when we have these high intensity wildfires, one of the things that happens is after the, the flames go out, every time it rains, we get these big erosion, debris flow and flooding events. And that's in part due to how those high intensity wildfires change how water moves through a watershed. So we get these big flows of debris and erosion that disrupts communities, it can damage roads. But importantly, from the perspective of a watershed like the Poudre and most of the watersheds on the Front Range and throughout the West, these are the waters that support our drinking water supply. Mm. So when we get these big erosion events and these big debris flows, it impacts the municipality's ability to pull water directly off of the river. So there was a lot of concern immediately after those wildfires about the long-lasting impacts to drinking water supply, the reliability of drinking water supply, uh, a lot of concern about how the ecosystems would be affected and, and whether there would be a need to do some type of uh, hill slope erosion control or stabilization or restoration work within rivers that had been affected by the fire. So very quickly, several water utility operators, local nonprofits, local government agencies who have regulatory roles in a large wildfire started coming together to talk about the who, what, where, when, why of mm. post-fire rehabilitation and restoration, mostly from the High Park Fire. That initial group was known as the High Park Fire Restoration Coalition. That group fairly quickly decided or realized that the needs from that one wildfire were going to last for at least five, if not more, years. And in looking at the impacts from that one wildfire, realizing that there was a lot of other territory, so to speak, in the watershed that could have another wildfire of that nature. And so they recognized a need for a longer term collaborative to come together and keep working on planning together where wildfire mitigation and forest restoration could happen in the watershed or should happen in the watershed to protect critical 
ecosystem functions like protecting water supplies, like protecting river ecosystems and communities in the forested areas of our watershed. So that was the genesis of forming Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. So a subset of those initial entities Mm -hmm. formed our first board of directors. Most of them are still on our board of directors. And then we have a stakeholder committee that meets roughly every other month uh, to keep planning and talking about different high priority issues in the watershed. For the most part, we have stayed fairly focused on issues that affect the upper portions of the watershed. So still, there's still a very strong focus on wildfire and forest restoration. We have, since around 2016, started working in the lower portions of the watershed, so east of the I-25, with a little bit more of a focus on river corridor flood resiliency building. Uh, So planning with those stakeholders where there are some high priority areas that could benefit from additional river restoration design and implementation. We haven't yet moved to implementation on any of those projects, but it's something we're working on right now. Yeah, I was about to ask, in addition to wildfires, are there other large scale events that affect your um, range and responsibility in the watershed? And yeah, floods is a big one. I Mm -hmm. don't know if this was on your radar, but uh, it seemed like there was two or three years ago, there was a really bad flood down in Evans or like South Greeley out there. And um, I know that some parts of Weld County can be really bad about flooding. Actually, in 2013, the whole Front Range was negatively affected by a a large-scale flood that affected most of the drainages on the Front Range. Mm -hmm. The Pooter was not as badly affected. It just didn't quite get as much rain as the Big Thompson and the St. Brain and a bit further south did during that event. So it was in September 2013, so that was already a little bit unusual for us to have that kind of large rain event at that time of year. In the Big Thompson and the St. Vrain, the damages were catastrophic, especially in the headwater areas. Uh, But there were large damages throughout the Platte and further, like east of the I-25. East of the I-25 and the Pooter, we did see some like direct damages from the flood of 2013. However, what we did see was subsequent to that event, so in future in years after 2013, those towns and uh, unincorporated areas started seeing uh, larger sort of flooding impacts for the same amount of rain. So it seemed like the 2013 event had altered the system in a way that was exacerbating flooding. And that that event was really what, or those observations were really what prompted some of those stakeholders to reach out to us and inquire if we would help support some more collaborative planning around flood issues in that portion of the the river corridor to start thinking about some of those issues and trying to bring some uh, some resiliency planning into into how we approach the river in that area. And anyone driving from northern Colorado up to Estes Park knows that the this restoration and these repairs, and uh, that's the Big Thompson, right? Mm-hmm. They're still going on. Yes. All the, these years later. Yeah. Our compatriots, our sister watershed group in the Big Thompson uh, and Estes Valley are still working on river restoration from those events. Um, so... Yeah, those those types of high impact events like very large wildfires or very large floods, just because it leaves the news cycle doesn't mean the impacts have left the system. So the the impacts last for years and years and take a really long time to rebuild and restore from not just because the technical aspects of it, you know, we generally have a pretty good sense of what we need to do, Mm -hmm. uh, but the the process can be long and time consuming. The planning, the permitting, the funding, and then getting the work done can take a lot longer. When you have the scale of impacts that we saw from the wildfires of 2012, the floods of 2013, it just takes a really long time to, to work through all the things that need to happen and, and get it done on, on the ground. You've already made me consider two large pieces in our conversation that I'd never really considered before. You're, you're right in my cognitive bias that 
I'm going to sit here and if you tell me to imagine the effects of a wildfire, mm. I'm going to imagine a roaring red and orange lit up forest. But to think about how it alters the landscape, the, the water. And while you were talking, I was thinking like all of a sudden you have thousands of trees who used to be mm. part of this watershed cycle. They're gone. There's no more of that, that like water soaking mm. from the ground that alters the, the river flow through mm. your area. And also flood effects. Not only, I would only have ever considered before today, honestly, mm. the, the idea of damage occurring during the flood, but that that can alter it and cause those same areas to be more likely to flood next time. I think these are things that a lot of people, if they're not in this realm, they may think, well, what is the coalition up to all the time? Mm. And now I'm, I'm sitting here like, wow, there's, there's always work to be done because these fires and floods may have happened five, seven years ago, but mm -hmm. you're still seeing and we're still, you know, cleaning up the uh, effects from those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the case of the Poudre with the 2013 floods, what at least what the assumption was is that that event deposited a lot of sediment into the channel downstream which is what constrained the, the channel's ability to keep moving water in the same way. And so um, that is the assumption of why we saw larger floods after that event. But you're correct for in the case of the wildfires, when it's a wildfire of that intensity, it does have fairly dramatic changes to the forest and the forest floor and the soils which is all connected to how water moves in the system. The challenging thing, or I guess the, the other side of the coin with our watersheds and the types of ecosystems we have throughout the West in the Rockies, is these are all fire-adapted ecosystems. So historically, fire was a very important component of the physical drivers in the ecosystems. It's was a part of the history of the of the forests. Our forests, as they change with elevation, part of what you're seeing is a change in the relationship with fire. When you walk through Ponderosa forests, the, that big, thick, shaggy bark on Ponderosas, that's one of their adaptations to living with or existing with wildfires. Except the types of wildfires that they mostly are adapted to are lower severity fires. So low to moderate severity fires that would kill off small trees, co competition sort of at the, at the forest floor. As we, as we sort of colonized throughout the West, one of the things that we did over the past century and a bit is suppress fires. Those wildfires are scary. <laughs> uh, they damage, they, you know, on the surface uh, or on the front of it, they damage our communities. They can threaten lives. So historically, there was a policy informally to put out all wildfires by 10 a.m. the next morning. But by doing that, what we did was remove wildfires' role in the forest of thinning out the forest and keep, especially in the Ponderosa forests. Uh, so over time, without fire, trees just continue to grow and grow and grow in the forest without having, because it doesn't have that removal process anymore. As a result, what is wood, really? What are trees? When you go camping, when you build a campfire, wood is just fuel. Mm. So by removing that physical... Uh, process of natural wildfires by suppressing wildfires we've allowed a lot of fuel to grow up in especially our mid-elevation forests which means when we do have a fire that we can't control they become big and high intensity with these suite of negative impacts so by removing fire we've made fire worse yeah you, we we took these matchsticks and we replaced them with dynamite because we haven't allowed these small burn-offs to take care of the underlings. And now if a fire were to occur, it's going to be much denser and harder to control. And it's mm -hmm. going to spread a lot easier and faster. Also something I hadn't considered. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an interesting process. One of the things that we're working on right now and have been with our partners, the Forest Service, NRCS, Colorado State Forest Service, um, and a host of um, researchers in Colorado Forest Restoration Institute is really talking with people about what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, what, how do we how do we restore forests in a way that we can 
make our forests less susceptible to these high intensity wildfires. So one of the other aspects of that is that we've been working on, we as in the us and all of our partners have been working on trying to bring fire back into our forests on purpose. So using prescribed fire. I can see the listener's face right now. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Are you sure about this? We are sure about yeah, it because yeah. we know that, while, like I've already said, wildfires are part of the ecology of these systems. So it is not just broadcast burning or prescribed fires, not just a management tool, but it is an ecologically relevant management tool. It also is done, as its name implies, prescribed burns are done very thoughtfully and very carefully with a lot of planning around it. Mm -hmm. It's not just some random person going to the forest and tossing a match. <laughs> uh, so, Flamethrowers out there. Exactly. It's called a, prescription, a prescribed fire because there's a very detailed prescription that goes with it and very, very specific sets of conditions under which prescribed fire can happen, including air quality, because there's certain, you know, you're putting smoke into the air, so you have to be very careful about what's happening air quality wise, how much humidity there is on the ground, how much resources you have to control and maintain the burn. So there's a lot of uh, work that goes into making a prescribed fire happen. Yeah. So we're, we're pretty confident that it's a good and useful tool there's a lot of conversation that needs to happen around it, though, because people are understandably a little bit wary of it, especially in places where they've already experienced negative impacts mm -hmm. from wildfires. So a lot of what we've been doing lately with our partners is just talking with people about, about what it means to live in a fire-prone landscape and how do we live better with wildfire yeah. in, in our midst, basically. Yeah, one of the strongest examples I can bring forth to memory about having this idea that there's some sort of symbiotic relationship between fire and trees. Mm -hmm. That seems like uh, an impossible re relationship as a child, right? Mm -hmm. It seems like fire equals bad for trees. But as when I went to Sequoia National Park and um, on the hike, we read this plaque and learned that the giant pine cones, which are like the size mm -hmm. of footballs, which were so cool to hold from these huge ancient trees, mm -hmm. the only way they're able to pop open and seed another tree is when a low intensity forest fire starts mm -hmm. and that heats these pine cones up to the point where they'll actually pop and then they'll be able to be planted. And that is like, oh, fire can it, and is a necessary part mm -hmm. to the health of this forest. And I feel like you know, even in our conversation right now here, mm -hmm. you've educated me, and I and I feel like is educating the average person is that part of what you all try to do in the coalition and just kind of like spread this awareness and and help the community understand everything that you all are up to, or we definitely try. Yeah. Uh, so we do uh, a lot of different types of outreach and education. So we do the standard nonprofit, you know, we have a booth at festivals, what have you, so that we can just answer questions with the community, whether it's here in Fort Collins or in smaller communities up in the headwaters. We also do a series of different types of tours of the watershed. Mostly right now we're just doing those in the headwater areas. So if you check out our website or sign up for our e-newsletter, you can get posts of when we're doing different types of tours. So we'll do tours of some of our project areas, ours or some of our partners, where we've done forest restoration, whether it's thinning with chainsaws or heavy equipment or doing bro or where broadcast burns or prescribed fires have happened. Uh, so we'll take people out and just show them what it looks like before and after you've done these types of restoration treatments. What is a what is a a restored forest look like? What does it look? How does it look different if you've done it by hand thinning versus broadcast burning? What does broadcast burning or prescribed fire look like right after you've done it? What does it look like two years later? A lot of people have conceptions about prescribed fire killing the forest, but really it doesn't. Um, you know, some trees will die. That's part and parcel of why we're doing it. And the trunks will get blackened and needles will turn red. But, you know, in the spring, right after a prescribed fire, the grasses will green up, shrubs will come back, 
many of the trees will rebud um, or uh, will green up again. So it's it's just important for people to see that uh, the forest is still alive and is in fact likely more alive if you if you can say that as a result of doing some of these treatments. Uh, it's very beneficial for wildlife. So we do t take people out and try and get them to physically see that. We also do, um, we started this last year and we'll do it again this year, uh, doing fire ecology tours. So we take people to gateway natural areas. So just up the canyon a couple miles and we bring some experts who are researchers either at, the, you know, at uh, Colorado State University or at Rocky Mountain Research Station and get them to do basically like forest fire CSI. So mm -hmm. taking people around and showing them uh, where you can see the fingerprints of the history of fire in the forest. So looking for fire scars on trees, talking about what wildlife or birds or plants might benefit uh, from having wildfire in their ecosystem. So it's really a good opportunity for people to learn how fire has shaped this landscape and also uh, some of the history of human use and interaction with wildfire. So native populations in this area also had a different kind of relationship with fire and the use of fire in the landscape. So you get to hear about that as well. So that's another sort of more tactile opportunity for people to learn and types of education that we do. Of course, we also have social media and website mm -hmm. and that type of thing where people in our e-newsletter where people can learn more about the actions that we're doing or opportunities to get involved. So those are our, our like main publicly accessible or general public accessible outreach and education opportunities. We also do more targeted education. So if we're looking at doing restoration treatments anywhere, especially in the, well, anywhere in the watershed, we will work specifically with those communities that are in or adjacent to the work that we're doing. So we'll do community meetings, do community design charrettes, and really try and work with the individuals who are going to be impacted either directly because we're working on their land or adjacent to it um, so that we're keeping that conversation in the community and building that understanding of why we're doing that work and trying to get feedback from those people um, mm -hmm. about what their concerns are and if it's feasible, if we can sort of build some of their concerns into our restoration designs. That's not always possible, but you know, to the extent that we can do it, we try and do that. So just really trying to keep a community conversation going about these issues because we don't own any land as an organization. We can only do things with the the permission of the people who own the land. So we need to maintain those, build and maintain those relationships and just respect how how other people see things similarly or different from us. Which I assume could be tricky because you all, I assume the Poudre River and um, some of your watershed goes through private land and you're having to work with people mm -hmm. and ask, hey, we have this, mm -hmm. we need to do this for flood control or we're doing this inspection or whatever. Are, are you cool with that? Right. So a lot of the work that we do is that we do is on private land in the headwaters, roughly more or less 50, 50 okay. is private public. Wow, okay. Most of the public is for service land. There's a small amount of other federal and a small amount of state land, but the remainder of that is mostly private land. And so that's why it's really important for us to work in partnership with agencies because especially the Forest Service, they're the ones who manage and own that land. And then to get anything done outside of the federally owned lands, we have to work with private landowners. You can't just like walk up to someone's property and be like, hey, I've got a chainsaw. I'm going to cut down some <laughs> trees. It's a, it's a long process to bring those people on board and work with them to understand what their desired outcomes are and how they may or may not fit into uh, the desired outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Yeah. So it is, it is a long process. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you had told me right before we turn on this microphone that for the 
Poudre River watershed, the main thing we talk about is fire. I would call you a crazy person. Well, you did. <laughs> you and, wouldn't be the first person it, to call me a crazy person. <laughs> right. It's just um, I learned something today, mm-hmm. and uh, I hope that you can do this for a lot of people in our community in the near and distant future. And if people are interested in learning more, reaching out to you, Jennifer, mm-hmm. hey, I want to get involved. This sounds awesome. Where should we send our listeners? So we have a website, www.poodrewatershed.org. So people can sign up for our e-newsletter there. We also have a Facebook site. So people can go to our Facebook. If you just Google Facebook, Pooter Watershed, you'll find our Facebook page. You can sign up. You can follow us on Facebook and you can sign up for our e-newsletter there as well. I promise we don't really send out the e-newsletter out more than once a month. And we don't give the newsletter, the emails away to anyone else without permission. So we won't load your inbox up with a bunch of newsletters or emails. Even if you did, it'd be a more refreshing topic than less <laughs> spam. Let's be so those are the main ways to keep in touch with us. We, uh, most of our stakeholder meetings are publicly announced in our newsletters. So and those doors are always open to the public. So people are welcome to come and join in on those conversations And like I said, we announce all of our our tours and other events in our newsletter and on our Facebook page so people can always keep in touch with what we're doing there. I will also say we didn't get a chance to talk about this, but we are also trying to start or are starting a citizen science water quality monitoring program this year. So that's another avenue for people who don't necessarily want to move rocks and dirt and cut trees all day to still get involved actively (laughs) in helping uh, improve our understanding of the watershed. Yes. Well, thank you for your time. Yeah, no problem. I hope we can send people your way. (laughs) I hope so too. (laughs) For more about this podcast or our other guests, visit www.themoreyouknowco.com. We have had so many wonderful conversations, you have to give the other episodes a shot. You never know what you're going to find. Thank you to Trevor for mixing and editing all our episodes. Thank you to Kelsey for our awesome logo and artwork. And Russell Isaac Long, my man, and guest of episode 67, is responsible for all our music used here on the Morinoco. So grateful for you, my friend. We will be back soon, listener. Who will it be? What the heck are we going to discuss next? Until next time, peace.